I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn open to 1 Peter 1, uh, 10 through 12 is where we're going to be at this morning. I don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up, my parents uh, would tell me when I still had food on my plate that, uh, that I could not get up from the table until I finished everything that was on my plate. Now, it's not so much a thing anymore. We kind of try to do that with our kids, but it doesn't work the way it did when I was a kid. Like when I was a kid, like you sat there and you finished your food and, you know, until you were done. And I was a smart aleck, right? And so my parents would tell me like, you know, you, you know, there, there are children in Africa that are starving right now, right? That, that do not have enough food to eat. And my dad worked for World Vision, right? So that's a little bit different than like when a normal dad said that. My dad worked for World Vision. He had traveled the world. He had seen those kids. And so he would say, you know, there are kids in the world right now that do not have enough food to eat. And me being the smart aleck I was, I'd be like, well, box it up <laughs> and send it to them because they can have my broccoli. But... Uh, you know, now I, now I know better, right? Now as you grow up as an adult, you realize that, that, that I was and am incredibly privileged. You know, you don't have to travel the world very much to realize and understand how privileged we are uh, as people who grow up in the West, right? The fact that we have food always in our, in our homes. We have running water in our homes, Uh, The fact that we get to go out and actually have a say in who leads our country, that we get to vote, that we live in a democracy. We are incredibly, incredibly privileged. One of the reasons that we take kids on trips to Mexico, or even adults, the reason we take mission trips is not only to proclaim the gospel, but to help people see and to understand how privileged we really are and, and what we're supposed to do with that privilege. I remember we took, uh, we took kids all the time down to Mexico. And I remember taking this group down to Mexico, and this one girl, we would always go down to Mexico, we'd build homes, and then we'd come back. And as we'd come back, we'd stay in San Diego for a night, and then we'd go back up to Washington. And as we were in San Diego at this nice hotel, this one girl was just weeping and crying. And I went up to her, and I said, what, what's wrong? And she said, I just don't know how I can go back to how I lived after seeing how other people lived. She had seen the poverty and the destitution of what we had experienced. And and unlike the other kids that were just ready to, to get me back home, get me into my bed, get me into my shower, get me to my TV and my iPhone, she said, I don't know how I can go back to that, realizing how many people live in such poverty. And that's probably, that's the point, right? That's what we're trying to help our kids understand, that they are incredibly blessed and they should use that blessing and that privilege to be a blessing to others. That's the point. We're not supposed to go back and live like we did. We're supposed to live differently, realizing how privileged we are, realizing how blessed we are. We're not to use all of that for ourselves. We're to use that to be a blessing to others. And sometimes we need to be reminded of just how privileged we are. It's all around us. It's everywhere. And so we forget it. And so sometimes we, sh- we need to be shocked. We need to go into a culture and understand how incredibly privileged we are. It changes our perspective. And that's what Peter's doing in this introduction, is he is trying to remind the believers how incredibly privileged they are in Christ. He's been reminding them that while they're scattered and while they're suffering, they cannot, rem- they cannot forget that they are incredibly privileged to be believers. This changes everything, and he is trying to help them understand that. And so in, in chapter 1, in this introduction, Peter reminds them of who they are, of what they've been given, and how they've been blessed. In verse 1, he reminds them that they are elect, that they are God's chosen people. They are chosen by God's grace, that they have been purchased by the blood of Christ, by the plan of God, and by the work of the Spirit. They are elect. Then in verses 3 through 12, Peter breaks out in this prayer and then this, this praise and that's what we've been looking at the last few weeks and and in that prayer he rejoices in who God is and what God has done 
In verses 3 through 5, he focuses on the fact that we have been born again, born again by God's mercy, and that this means that we have been given a living hope, an eternal inheritance, and a secure salvation. And then in verses 6 through 9, and we looked at last week, he tries to take their suffering that they are enduring and he tries to put it in perspective for them by helping them remember that their suffering is only temporary. And through it, they are being matured and they are given opportunities to glorify the Lord. And that, make, and, and that, that is making them more like Jesus, right? We saw that last week, that this is what he is trying to remind them of, that their suffering is only temporary and that they have been given a joy in Christ that is, that is indescribable, that nothing can take away, and it is only found in Jesus. Well, now in the final section of this prayer, Peter's going to conclude by trying to get them to understand how incredibly privileged we really are, that God has been at work both in our past and in our present to provide something for us, something that others longed for, that others wished they could have, that you and I, by God's grace, that we have been privileged to actually receive. And so let's read together 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, in understanding how privileged we are as followers of Jesus. Concerning this salvation... The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, they searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. In the things that have now been announced to you, through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Let's pray. Father, as we uh, open up your word again, Lord, I pray that your spirit would impact our hearts. Lord, that you would remind us of how blessed we have been. And Lord, that we would use that blessing not just for our own advantage or our own comfort, God, but that we would use that blessing to be a blessing to others as you've called us to. That we would be light and salt to a dying world. So Lord, would you teach us now from your word and encourage our hearts as you've done for thousands of years to believers that have read this text. Teach us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we come to the the end of this prayer. Peter has been praying this long prayer, rejoicing in who God is, and we come to this last section. And the first thing that we see is how the past reveals our privilege. How the past, how looking back and seeing what happened before us reveals our privilege. Specifically, Peter is going to focus on how, our, how we are privileged over the prophets of the Old Covenant. How we are privileged over the prophets of the Old Covenant. That's what he's trying to say in this passage. Look at verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Now, Peter is referring back to the salvation that he has been describing, right? Concerning this salvation, regarding this salvation that I've been describing, regarding the salvation that I've been talking to you about, I want to let you know one last thing about this salvation. And he tells us here that the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Now, a prophet, if you uh, have, if you're familiar with the Bible at all, you probably know a prophet is a person, it was an office that somebody was called to where they would speak the words of God, right? God did not speak directly to the people. He spoke through prophets, Moses, Moses, 
Elijah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, right? There are many, many prophets that God spoke through, but they were all people that God spoke directly through. And sometimes the message was for the people of that day, right? Repent, turn, Babylon is coming, Assyria is coming, go back to the Lord. If you don't go back to the Lord, you're going to be destroyed, right? That's, that's a common theme of the prophets, right? Over and over again, turn from your idolatry, turn to the Lord or you will be destroyed. But sometimes the message they spoke was about a future hope, a future salvation, that they didn't fully understand, that they didn't realize, and that they didn't know exactly what it was talking about. And here Peter explains that they were prophesying, right? He explains who, these who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours and mine. That, that there was a coming day. This was a common theme. There was a coming day of God's grace, of God's salvation. Whether they were getting ready to go into captivity or whether they were in captivity, God was promising them that one day there would be salvation. Prophecies such as Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For us, for to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of the hosts will do this. Now we read that and we, we absolutely take that for granted, right? We read that at Christmas time and we know exactly what it means. We, we understand who this child is. We understand what this prophecy was trying to say. But the people that Isaiah is writing to who are in captivity, who, who have no sight of what is to happen, they don't understand it. It's, it's something that they long for, something that they are hoping for and, and desiring and praying for, but they do not understand it. That's what Peter's trying to say. He says the prophets, they, they searched and inquired carefully. They, they wanted to know what it meant. They wanted to know who this was and when this would take place, and so they searched. The word search means to, to seek diligently. They inquired. The word inquired means to examine carefully and for a long period of time. And so these two words used together are this picture that, they, that they are, they're searching and longing and desiring to know what these prophecies are speaking about. They're longing to know when these prophecies would be fulfilled. Go on to verse 11. They were inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. All right, verse 11 tells us they wanted to know who and they wanted to know when. We can, we can relate to that, right? There's, many, there's prophecies that are coming for us that we want to know the same thing, right? You take, for instance, the prophecy of the Antichrist, right? We want to know, we want to know who, right? There's people guessing all the time, right? Throwing out names. Maybe that guy is it. Maybe that guy is it. And we want to know when. Like, is it now, Lord? Is it coming? Is it soon? Is, is, is he already here? What's going on, right? We want to know who and when. And that's, that's what Peter tells us. These prophets wanted to know these things. And then here he tells us the source of these prophecies. And don't miss this, this is important. The source of these prophecies, he tells us, it was the spirit of Christ in them who was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was the spirit of Christ in them. 
Here Peter is referencing the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. He is helping us understand, as many other places in Scripture help us understand, that this book that we have, that this is not words that men wrote down of their own choosing, but rather men moved by the Spirit of God, wrote down what God intended them to say. And so we have the Word of God. Do you realize how privileged we are? We have the Word of God given to us. And most of it explained thoroughly for us that we would know God's character and know God's grace and know what God desires for us. We have been given an amazing privilege. 2 Peter 1.21, Peter says again in his second letter, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. He tells us that these prophecies, these words that we have, they, are not, they were not just man-made thoughts. They were men moved by God. And then 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, these are verses I would encourage you to know and memorize or at least know where to find these. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Both Peter and Paul say this is the word of God. It was given by God through men, inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is inspired, and it is inerrant. It is without air in its original autographs. And we have, as translations and as as textual criticism, we have the reliable, trustworthy word of God to us. You know, I read a, a statistic recently that of people who identify themselves as evangelical Christians, over 80% of people no longer believe that this is the inerrant word of God. Friends, we are living in a time and in a moment where we cannot take for granted how privileged we have been. And Satan will do everything he can to destroy our trust and our credibility in the word of God, making us think, this is just like any other book. You can make it up as you go along. Choose your own adventure Christianity. And we need to be people of the book, remembering that it is God's word that must lead us daily. We must never take our privilege for granted. Peter tells us here that that they searched that they inquired carefully the prophecies of God to understand them. And and they didn't have a Bible in their home. They didn't have a Bible on their phone. They, they, They had the word of God given that was inscribed down, and then they studied it, and then they shared it, and then they studied it, and they taught their kids, and they studied it. And I wonder the question is, How do we treat God's word? Do we search and inquire and study? Does it affect our lives? Do we know it? Do we meditate on it? Do we put it in our hearts? Or do we just listen on Sunday? If you want to be a Christian that is growing in Christ, that is maturing in Christ, you must be in the Word. Now, I know you've heard that from the time if you grew up in Sunday school and church, you know that. The question is, you know that, but have you actually applied that? There are many people that are in their 50s, 60s, 70s that are old but immature. 
because they don't know the word of God. If you are young right now, you should start by putting the word of God into your heart that you might mature and grow in Christ. May we learn from those that have gone before us. May we search and inquire that the word of God may shape us and shape our hearts, that we would know how privileged we are. And what is the main emphasis of these prophecies? Well, Peter tells us in verse 11, the main emphasis of these prophecies was that the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Peter says, if you take all these prophecies about the future and about hope and you pile them together, they have two main themes. Those themes are the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories of of Christ. This is what they were searching for. This is what they did not understand. And the suffering of Christ, obviously, we know, is the cross. It is the central point of all of redemptive history. All of the Old Testament is pointing forward to the cross. All of the New Testament is pointing back to the cross. It is the central point of all of redemptive history. He says the suffering of Christ. And the, the, the prophets could not understand. They had, no, they had no concept for a category of where God would come to earth in human form as both God and man. He would, he would live as among us. He would suffer with us, yet without sin, he would die on the cross, and then he would rise from the grave. There was no concept for that. There was no understanding of that. How could a transcendent God come and suffer on earth? This is the beauty of the gospel. This is what Peter is telling them. They long to understand it, but you, you have been privileged to know what these, these mean. They meant that Jesus was willing to die for your sin and in your place. That he would humiliate himself. That he would go to the cross. And that he would bear our sin. The prophets wrote this, Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, probably a a verse that you're very familiar with, but you can imagine they struggled to understand what did this mean? Isaiah 53, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The prophet wrote this over a thousand years before Jesus would come. And the the prophets would, would, would read this and study it and they would write it and they had no idea what it meant. That somehow this suffering servant who was God was gonna suffer and they they just didn't understand what it meant. And Peter's saying, you <laughs> You are privileged to know exactly what this means. And it means that Jesus would suffer and die for your sins. Friends, what are you going to do with that? You see, this is the heart of the gospel, that Jesus came and lived a perfect life and died in our place and for our sins. What are we going to do with that privilege of knowing that and, and, and understanding that? What are we going to do with that? You know, I have to stop and I have to ask, have you believed and trusted that Jesus died for your sins? 
Not just that knowledge is out there, but have you personally believed and trusted that Jesus has died for your sin? That he came and died in your place, and then he rose from the grave. You see, this is what it means to be a Christian. It doesn't mean that we are good people who do good things. It means that we are people who have been saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ, that we have been confronted with our sin, that we have recognized our sin, that we have realized our offense against God, and then we have called out to Jesus for salvation. We've realized that Jesus came and died and rose again, and we have placed our faith in Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian, not to go to church, not to be a good person, To be a Christian means that you have placed your faith and your hope in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Have you done that? Have you called out to him for salvation? Have you acknowledged him as your Lord and your Savior? If you haven't done that, Friends, I want to invite you this morning to call out to the Lord. He is offering you salvation and forgiveness. If you will just call out to him, acknowledge yourself a sinner, believe that Christ died for you and rose from the grave and give your life to him as Lord and Savior, you too can receive the grace that Peter is talking about. You can receive the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to do that later, if you want to talk to someone, I'd love to, I'll be around, I would love to talk to you about what it means to put your faith or your hope in Jesus Christ. This is the central part of the gospel. But he he goes on, he says, not only did they prophesy about the suffering of Christ, but they also prophesied about the glories of Christ, the glories of Jesus. And here we know he is speaking of the resurrection and the ascension and the coming glorification of Jesus Christ. This was prophesied not only in the Old Testament and, 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 and fulfilled in the New Testament. We see prophecies like Hosea 6, 1 through 2, A prophecy that doesn't make full sense until we understand in the New Testament. Hosea 6, 1 through 2 says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up, and after two days he will revive us, and on the third day he will raise us up that we may live before him. See, that verse only makes full sense in the understanding that, it, that the way we are given life is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Daniel 7, 13 to 14 talks about a future day. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, and with the clouds of heaven there came like one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and he was presented before him, And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. You see, the prophets, as they they spoke these words and as they studied these words, they wondered, who is this son of man? And then as Jesus came, he identified, I am the son of man. Peter tells us that that what they wrote was not for them, but here's what's amazing. What they wrote was for you and for me. Look what he says in verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. Their prophecies, many of them, were not for them in that time and in that moment. Their prophecies were for us. They were for those who would come after Christ, who would understand the full manifestation of God's grace in Jesus Christ. And so what Peter is saying here is that you and I are more privileged even than the prophets who spoke the words of God because we have received the grace 
of Jesus Christ. Stop for a moment and let that sink in. That you and I, because we live in the time that we live and because we have been blessed in the way that we have been blessed, that we are more privileged than Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, the ones who God spoke through, the ones who saw the water parted, we are more privileged because we have known and received the grace of Jesus Christ. Something that the Old Testament prophets could only have longed for, we have been given in Christ. And so the question is, what are we doing with that privilege? How are you daily reminding yourself of how incredibly blessed you are? Or will you become like the average American who lives in wealth and complains that they don't have enough? Or looks at other people and thinks, man, I I need more, right? We have been so privileged. And here spiritually we are reminded of that. We have been privileged. How are we using that privilege? How are we going to use it to be a blessing to others? I pray the Holy Spirit would begin to give you insight. How is he calling you to use what he's given you to be a blessing to others, to glorify God in the lives of others? that we would not just hold this to ourselves. How are we sharing that blessing with those who do not know Jesus Christ? You are more privileged than all of the Old Testament prophets because you know Jesus. Let that sink in for a minute. But not only are you more privileged because of the past, Peter goes on and says you are more privileged because of your present as well. You are more privileged because of your present, how the present reveals our privilege. And there's two things that Peter points out here of our present situation, how we are privileged because of of, of what we have experienced. The first here is the gospel. He points out the gospel makes us privileged. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Peter reminds them, he reminds us that by God's grace, he brought those that preached the gospel, that we could hear the gospel, that we could respond to the gospel. Here it is called the good news. The good news translated euangelion, it means the good news. It was the gospel. It was the gospel of Jesus Christ that was given and that that we could receive this. Now here he says, the, the, the ones who brought it to them, this could be, a, this could be apostles, or this could just be everyday Christians who, who were willing to preach the good news of the gospel. And Peter is telling them they are privileged because God sent them people who would preach the gospel, that they might hear the gospel, that they might respond to the gospel. Friends, when is the last time that you and I gave thanks to God that we were allowed to hear the message of truth? You realize every time that we gather on a Sunday or gather online or gather in the barn that we get to hear the gospel in our own language, how incredibly privileged we are. You realize, of course, there are Millions and billions of people around the world that have never heard the good news of the gospel. And that's not just people in China and Iraq and Iran. That's people in your neighborhood that have never heard the gospel. They know they heard the word Christian. They've heard of the Bible. They've heard of Jesus. But nobody's ever shared with them the gospel message of their sin and their salvation 
in Jesus Christ. But somebody, by God's grace, has shared it with you. And God, by his grace, has opened your heart and your eyes and allowed you to respond and that you are a Christian. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been so incredibly privileged. And you are not privileged to use it for yourself. You are privileged to serve the Lord. And what are we doing with that? Peter wants to make sure that these believers understand, even though they're scattered, even though they're suffering, even though they're hurting, that they have been incredibly privileged in Christ. They have heard the gospel message, and so have you and I. What a privilege we have been given. And if that wasn't enough, Peter goes on, his final words, he tries to give one last understanding of how privileged we are. And he says this, Things into which angels long to look. Things, meaning the gospel, the good news, the gospel which angels long to look. Peter is here, saying here, not only are you more privileged than the prophets who spoke the words of God, you and I, because we have heard the gospel and been given the ability to respond to the gospel, we are more privileged than the angelic hosts of God. Let that sink in for a moment. Peter is saying that you and I are more privileged than the angelic hosts of God. Look what he says here. He says they long to look. The word long here, epithumia in, in the Greek, it is, uh, it, it's a word that actually can be translated lust in certain contexts because it is such a strong desire. It means to have a strong, intense desire. And to look is to, is to bend over and to, to look into if you've ever, whoa, holy moly, what happened here? I just got caught. <laughs> All right. If you've ever been to Israel uh, and you've gone into one of the two locations that they identify as possible locations of the tomb, you know that the only way to get in there is to, is to stoop down, is to bend down, to crawl in. And that's the, the picture, the word picture that's being used here is that the angels are, are stooping over the earth that they are looking down intently and they're wondering why? <laughs> why, God, are you pouring out your grace on these people why would you have chosen to go and rescue them? They are a rebellious people. They do not love you. They refuse you. They reject you. They curse your name. Why would you go and die for them? And Peter says, because you and I have been recipients of the grace of God that we are more privileged even than the angelic host who are perfectly righteous, who serve the Lord without question because we have been recipients of God's grace. What a privilege we've been given. What a privilege the Lord has placed upon us that we would be welcomed back into God's family. Though we were rebellious, though we rejected Christ, that God in his mercy would reach down, would share the gospel with us, that we might understand that Christ died for us and rose from the grave, that we could put our trust and our faith and that we could be forgiven. Peter says, you have been more privileged than even the angels themselves. Well, friends, what are we doing with that privilege? Right? That, I think that's what Peter's trying to lead us to. What are we doing with that privilege? There's at least three things that I, I want you to think about. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want you to think about these three things. Number one, thankfulness. I think this privilege is meant to help us understand how incredibly blessed we have been, and the response to that should be 
thankfulness. Like Peter here who is praying this prayer of praise and blessing and thanksgiving to God, that should be our response. When we understand how privileged we are, our response should be thankfulness to God. Secondly, humility. This privilege ought to cause us to be humbled. It ought to help us to be reminded that that we have been saved in the way that we have been saved, not because of who we are, but because of who God is. Because God, who is great in mercy, chose to save us. And so as we look at the world around us and as we look at people who are enemies of God, they're not our enemies. They're people who need Jesus. We are not saved because we're better, we're more righteous, we're somehow special. We were saved by God's grace that could be poured out on any person, and but by God's grace, there go I. Whatever sin it is, whatever lifestyle it is, but by God's grace, that would be me. I'm not immune from any sin, and neither are you. This should lead us to humility, that we might see people through the eyes of Jesus who came to rescue and to save. And finally, responsibility. I pray that this understanding of our privilege would lead us to responsibility, that we have been given an enormous privilege. And just like we have been given the enormous wealth that we have been given as a country, not so that we would just soak it all in and live for ourselves and, and build bigger houses and buy bigger cars and, 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 and do that. We have been given all that we have been given so that we could be a blessing to others, right? That's what scripture teaches us. We are to use what we have been given to bless others. The same is true spiritually. We have been not been given all this privilege so that we can just sit around in our small groups and, and thank God together. We have been given it so that we could go be a blessing to others, that we can be missionaries, those that are sent, those that proclaim the gospel and who live as salt and light in the lives of others. This is what we have been called to. The privilege that we have been given is not for ourselves, is so that we might be a blessing to others. And so let me ask you, what are you doing with the privilege that God has given you? You have received the gospel of grace. Have you shared that with others? Have you allowed your your Christian life to be a blessing to others that you would serve, that you would give, that you would sacrifice, that you would be salt and light? This is why we have been given all that we have been given, to use it to serve the Lord and to serve others. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we are humbled this morning as we are once again reminded of the incredible blessing and privilege that we have been given. God, that... that Old Testament prophets long to understand, we take for granted, that angels long to to receive the same kind of relationship that we have with God, we take for granted, that the word of God that so many people do not have in their own language, in their own tongue, Lord, we take for granted, God, would you this morning, would would you remind us and would you humble us and would you change us, God? Would we be like that that young woman that said, I can't go back and live the same way I did knowing what I know. God, would we be people that would say, I cannot live the same way I live knowing all the grace that I have been given in Jesus Christ. And so Holy Spirit, change us and conform us into the image of your son. Conform us into the image of Christ that we might be salt and light and the blessing that you've called us to be. We need you for that, Lord. We can't do it on our own. And so help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.